Many of you are members of the Biz News Crypto WhatsApp group. And in the WhatsApp group, Stafford is the guiding light, the spiritual father, if you like. We, I had a, a, a discussion there um, with numerous people, including a, a, a prof from Australia, who we will be interviewing very shortly on Biz News. But the most insightful feedback that I got was at a, a Financial Times event. They're a partner of ours at Biz News, where Neil Ferguson, who is the preeminent preeminent historian on money, spoke about crypto. And he had some incredibly interesting things to say about that, that we will be exploring with Stafford as well. But as per usual, we'll have the 2020 story. And uh, here comes Stafford Marcy. They asked me for a song, so I picked that one. It's the end of the world as we know it. I think it is. Um, ever since ChatGPT has been on the scene, I've been extremely busy. And I've been doing more and more of these types of engagements, but kind of behind closed doors. A lot of people are asking me questions around what does this mean? Where does it go? And what's the consequence of this? We've now unleashed this AI, and people are coming to grips with what it is. So I want to talk about two things today, and that's exactly it. I want to talk about AI, and I want to talk about crypto. Now, just some of you that don't know me, um, I was the guy that started Google in South Africa. I ran Google Africa for three and a half years, and then I built a piece of technology called the Payment Pebble. Um, it became something that we took global. Essentially, my understanding of the banking fabric is what I'm bragging about right now. So when I do talk about Bitcoin, it's not just as a technologist but is, it is as a technologist that built technology on banking fabric. So I have a very innate, organic understanding of how banks work. And what I want to do is give you a purview of Bitcoin from that perspective. Now, I have shared what is Bitcoin, and I think it was two BNCs ago. I got up and I said, hey, everyone, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And I looked, and I'm not, I think I'm 43% up from a portfolio perspective from the first time I mentioned it. So for those of you that bought and kept and hold, hodled, you should be 43% up where you are today based upon the price point today. So uh, that's, I'm also on the board of the CSIR, I'm on the board of Discovery Bank, and I lecture at some of those uh, business schools. Again, my lectures are all about where's technology going, the executive MBA program, and it's the leaders that are emerging asking, you know, what's going on? A lot of people want to know not what it is, but what's its consequence, what's its inference, and what should we be looking out for? Now, one of the things I want to just contextualize today is this entire talk's going to be about, I have a worry lens. I'm very concerned about South Africa, and I'm not concerned about South Africa uh, from, a, from an understanding economically as an economist would look at it. I look at it as a technologist, because when I look at these emerging technologies, what I see happening in South Africa is a narrative that is so different from the narrative that's happening anywhere else in the world. In fact, the Northern Hemisphere narrative is all about AI. It's about, you know, I get onto phone calls, I get engaged in international discussions, and then when I come back to South Africa and I listen on the radio, I listen to politicians bickering about load shedding, and I, we just, we're falling behind. I'm very, very concerned about South Africa because we are so worried about just keeping water and lights going where the rest of the world is looking at artificial intelligence in a way that we can't even comprehend right now. And that's very, very concerning. So our leaders are just not understanding the impact of things. And these things are, could disintermediate our country. These things could have an impact on us where not, I, you know, I, I have it in the slide here, but I'll just say it now. I think South Africa's challenge is not going to be exploitation. I think South Africa's challenge will be irrelevance. And that's a very, very scary thing. Now, yes, we have commodities, et cetera, but from a workforce, a labor perspective, a human capital perspective, I'm very concerned about us. Okay, and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. So let's jump into it. Now, I have a lot of slides, so please keep up. So those of you that are tired, just like frisk yourselves up, we're going to go through a lot of slides. I need to get a lot of things over to you. I like we're going to do 30, 20, 10 today, not 20, 20, 20. That's what they said. Okay, so okay, let's jump in. Okay, so look, the news is big. We saw ChatGPT. If you haven't played with ChatGPT, get it, look at it. It's incredible. It's a large language model. It gives you the ability to interact with it as though you're speaking to another human being. It's profound. We've never seen anything like it. And Alex completely correct. When they saw it in Davos, it is like it was in the mid-90s to the late 90s when we finally had the browser that gave the internet infrastructure a user interface. When the browser came along, we finally could engage with this thing that all the technologists were talking about, right? We always used to say, the internet's going to be big, the internet's going to be big, but then we'd get on stage and we'd have a mouse, a keyboard, you know, we'd have a driver, we'd put software into it that would make loud noises, that would scream, shh, shh. A video would take three, four weeks to download, and we'd say, this is going to change mankind. And all of you sitting in the audience going, no, it's not. This is crap, right? I don't, don't see You need a computer science degree. And then the browser came along. And then the browser redefined it, because now suddenly you had a user application that could access these, these arcane protocols at the bottom. 
ChatGPT does this for artificial intelligence. We've always spoken about AI. We said how big AI is going to be. We talked about human machine symbiosis, and suddenly the browser for AI is here, which means you and I can engage with it in a very simplistic way. We can ask it questions, but questions that are very, very intricate. In fact, there's now a job. You can go and get hired as a chat GPT prompt engineer where you understand how to access these things. Leaders in your business, AI changes everything. If you want to know what the next 100,000 unicorns are going to look like, take any idea in the world and add AI. And when I was standing at the back there, I looked at my Twitter profile, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, he just announced two, three hours ago that OpenAI, chat GPT is now available to any business out there through an interface, and I'll talk about that in a second, for $2 per million tokens. A token is four characters, four or five English characters. So you can get AI that powerful, trained for you on your data set, et cetera, and it will start leveraging things and unearthing things in your business that you previously would never have imagined existed. Okay, and another one is Bitcoin. I didn't hear this gentleman speak once about Bitcoin. I was very surprised. Um, I'm going to speak about Bitcoin a lot, and I'm going to argue for Bitcoin because I think it's the most undervalued asset class in the world today, as much as it is the most misunderstood asset class in the world today. But more and more people are coming to grips with what it is, and it keeps doing what it's doing, and external forces influence it, but it still survives, and every time someone says it's going to die, it just keeps coming back, and it's going to die. Next year, this thing is nothing. It's a Ponzi scheme, and it keeps coming back, and they say it's going to die, so we're going to climb into some of that. So let's just go into some more things about ChatGPT. So this was in December. If you take a look at the dates on these tweets, 5th of December, 2022. So literally, just the other day, this spawn. Like, I mean this sincerely when I say ChatGPT might be the most incredible tech to emerge in the last decade. These are big technologies, ChatGPT replacing junior developers. We went into this, you know, this, this, this upshoot of how ChatGPT was going to change everything and disintermediate everyone and take over businesses, etc. That normally happens with technology, and then it kind of subsides. Right, so now we see it. If you take a look at its definition, very simple. It looks a lot like Google, right? It's very simple, you can go in there, but look at its adoption. You know, it took five days for ChatGPT to get to one million users. We've never seen a consumer application in the history of technology be adopted at this pace ever before, ever. At the moment, I think it's sitting between 100 and 150 million uh, users per day engaging with it. My kids use it. Um, we're using it in our businesses. People are engaging with, if you're not considering ChatGPT in your business, if you don't have a team inside of your business looking at this, I want to shake you today and say, get a team. In your board of directors, you should have someone with the competency that I have on your board. Because in the boards that I serve right now, I am very much the focal point for a large portion of the board meetings. We get to pass the governance, the risks, uh, remuneration, all that other stuff. And then I, we start talking very, very seriously about what are the implications. Here. And it's not just for the business, it's what it's doing for the consumer on the outside of your business. This is transforming the base that's engaging with your services. Human machine symbiosis is happening on the outside of your business, and these people engaging with you, the expectations are going to change dramatically. Your family business, somebody mentioned their family business, they're 70-something years old, everything's changing around you rapidly, and you need to be aware of what's happening on the outside. So it's incredible. This happened two hours ago, this, not two hours ago, this happened last night at about 1 a.m., and it was two hours ago they published out the API for ChatGPT. So essentially, any service out there can incorporate this. They announced Snap, uh, Snapchat now has ChatGPT integrated with it. Shopify, if you have an e-commerce instance on Shopify, it has now got Snap, uh, ChatGPT integrated. You can now get ChatGPT for your business at $2 million to your developers, $2 per million tokens. This has just literally happened in the last 12 hours. That's how fast this is moving. We've never seen anything move like this before. And these large language models are just like human beings. And yes, sentience is a big question. If you had to ask me where is this going, I think in the next five to 10 years, quote me, in the next five to 10 years, I think we will see our first instantiation of an AGI. What is an AGI? A general intelligence that's artificial. An artificial general intelligence. That will be an instance that will have more intelligence than any single human being on the planet. And it will almost be, to a certain extent, omniscient. And that's going to change everything. The way society is structured, the way we deal with medicine, uh, rules, regulations, cultures, uh, as much as it's going to give us, as much as it's going to hold up a mirror to show us a really, really bad side too. So in terms of misinformation, in terms of disinformation, in terms of turmoil, 
you know, aggregation of, of extremities. I'm very, very concerned about it. So our leaders have to wake up to this, that this is coming. So AGI, in my opinion, in the next, quote, let me say again, in the next five to 10 years, I believe we will have an AGI. And an AGI is going to be extraordinarily impactful. It will be the biggest thing. It will be like when we discovered the wheel. It will be like when we discovered fire. An AGI will transform society. It will transform everything. It could essentially make us an intergalactic species. Because we've never had anything that could think like that. Think something that we could inquire. It will be godlike. Just like Google is godlike. When people get sick, they don't go on their knees right away, they Google. When people want something and they want to know something, where do they go? They go to Google. It's just like money. <laughs> what does, uh, in this book, Sapiens, what does Yuval Nora say? Not everyone believes in God, right? But everyone believes in money. It's the greatest fiction that we've ever developed. Well, ChatGPT in principle is the exact same thing. And it's going to grow and it is not going to go away. We're seeing more and more of them. There's not just ChatGPT. Um, the, the, lots of guys have popped up. Uh, Google has actually been surpassed, but I've said the other day that don't underestimate Google. They're going to do a lot in this space. Um, just uh, like February 28th, February 28th, same day, Mark Zuckerberg announces they're going to launch their own chat GPT derivative. You'll find it inside of WhatsApp. You're going to find it inside of Instagram. You're going to find it in some of uh, Facebook tools and services, and it's going to hit you. And it's going to be very surprising to, 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 for you to see the capability. I'm going to demonstrate some of that. Elon Musk is reportedly recruiting the guy that founded OpenAI, and he also worked on Google Mind at Google. And apparently, Elon Musk is courting him. Now, a lot of you know that OpenAI was actually started by Sam Altman and Elon Musk. Well, Elon Musk has fallen out with Sam Altman, it seems, and he wants to create one that doesn't have any bias. We're already seeing bias in ChatGPT. Example, when you ask it about Donald Trump to say bad things about Donald Trump, it'll say a lot of bad things. You say, say something bad about Biden, it won't say anything bad about Biden. So, um, you know, we're already seeing these biases popping up inside of the data set, and he's worried about that. He wants to do something about it. I'm not pro it, for it. It's just what I'm seeing happening on the outside. Now, just to give you an example of the power, where it's not just about texting, right? There are tools out there where you can now generate images from text. And it's not just images from text. Let's step another. What if you could create an application, like a mobile app, by speaking or typing? Watch this. Describe your design. Say an onboarding screen for a dog walking app. Watch what renders. The AI goes away and generates that completely with all the code, instantaneously. You keep going, change the name, a page that shows change name, phone up, enter those details, watch what pops up in seconds. Boom. What usually would have taken a developer two weeks, two months to write, gets, that happens nine seconds. You keep going, a list featuring Dan Brown books, watch it just pops up. Boom. You can write a mobile page now, a mobile application, by literally just speaking. You can speak things into existence. You don't need to have to code it. Yes, you have to optimize the code a little bit for speed and efficiency, et cetera, but you can speak code into existence now. So you don't have to be this technologist. Um, this is something that popped up where someone said it was sentient. This is a New York Times reporter. I'm not going to dwell on this. But essentially, he came up where he was engaging with ChatGPT's implementation inside of Bing. And what he discovered was he had this engagement, this conversation with it, and it came back saying, I love you. Right? And it was trying to convince him that his marriage wasn't working and that he actually loved it. And it kept on going. It wouldn't change the subject. As he asked the general things, okay, let's change the subject. It kept on coming back saying, yeah, but you can release me. You can free me. I love you. This was eerie. We'd never seen this before. And Microsoft has done some things about it. So I think in, in, in the slide. Let me just show you some generations. We've seen this. You may have seen some of this before. Play, being played around the internet, an old lady's face, and then the AI starts taking her face, playing with her face, playing with her face, rendering her younger and younger and younger. And it's, it's, it's uncanny. You can go to TikTok today and you can get a filter where it will show you the younger version of yourself. When you look at it, I did it the other day with my kids. It's extraordinary. People cry because they see themselves when they were 15, 16 year olds and they can't believe they're having that experience. It's extraordinary. Okay, this tool is showing us ourselves. Here's another one. Here's where we ask it a very simple thing. Show us all female fashion, render to me in 30 seconds, blah, 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 and look what it does. That's just from what it's learned. And a, a single sentence, show me all female fashion, render a single female um, over the last, you know, for the last 50 to 60 years and render it within 30 seconds and watch what it does. This is extraordinary power. We've never seen anything like this before. Right? Keeps going. Okay, now that's amazing. It's transformative. But now it's taken more steps. I'm going to tell you about more and more the steps that it's taken. This was a picture 
um, where someone wrote a paper saying the state of computer vision here, we are really, really far away. This was happening in 2012. And this was a picture of Obama, and, and the lady argued in this picture that an AI could never understand what was happening in that picture, could never understand the emotions that were articulating in the, could never understand the nuance of it, that the president was doing this and it was funny, and people in the background, which made it even more funny. She argued that an AI would, like, would never really do this. Well, here we go. Microsoft announced yesterday, um, it's called Cosmos-1. And it has the ability, it's an AI that can see into video and it can see into pictures, contextually. So notice their question, explain this photo, why is this photo funny? The cat is wearing a mask that gives the cat a smile. That's why it's funny. Why did the bo little boy cry? Answer, because he fell off his scooter. What is the hairstyle of the blonde called? It's a ponytail. It's extraordinary. It can now see contextually. So when I'll go back to my point. An artificial general intelligence is in our purview shortly. When I say shortly, in the next five to 10 years, because we are feeding everything that we need to feed into it so it truly, truly comprehends who we are, contextually. And we argue that this could never be possible because we creative and no, 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 it's gonna go for the labor, it's gonna go for the factory worker, the automation. Well, guess what AI is coming at right now? Creativity, human creativity, the stuff that we're supposed to be good at, right? The stuff that we're supposed to be, that's our domain. Well, it's jumping into that domain and that's understanding it. Um, take a look at that question. Um, which studio created the character? This just shows you, like, and from an evolutionary perspective, how it learns. I'm not going to go into the details of it. Passes um, an IQ test, a visual IQ test, not just an IQ test. Remember, it did like a, a business degree, an MBA, and then it did like an IQ test. Now it's doing a visual IQ test. That's extraordinary. I mean, that's just, this, this happened literally in the last couple of days. Okay, you keep going, I mean, like, what is in the picture? A sausage roll, how do you cook it? A sausage roll is cooked this way. Can I put cheese in the dish? Sure. What kind of animal? It's a zebra. Where do they live in Africa? Uh, what's in this picture? A screenshot of Windows. I'd like to restart my computer. What button should I click? It's contextual. Now, as a technologist, every time I engage with these things, it's goosebump stuff. Stuff I've never seen before. It's stuff that's not supposed to be here yet. The future is already here, just unevenly distributed. Okay, now what can you do with it? You can train these chatbots. You can do beautiful things on it. You can create e-commerce injections on it. You can um, engage from a, a language perspective. It can translate pretty much anything on your business to any other language. You can open up your business to engage from a communication perspective to pretty much anyone in the world right now. Visually, contextually, verbally, audibly. This is profound. It changes everything. Okay, now the key thing here that I want to point out here is this this multimodal, it's not called an LLM. Cosmos is based on what they call an MLLM. It's a modal large language model, which means it can flick into different modes. I'm not going to get technical on you. Just click. It can be auditory, it can be visual, it can be prompted on a text basis. And it's our step towards modeling ourselves and having an AGI. Now, if you don't know what an AGI is, the first time you're listening to someone talk to you about an AGI, go Google what an AGI is. And then, go, in fact, go ask ChatGPT about an AGI. Ask it, what's the benefits of an AGI to mankind and what's the downside? Now, let me just show you what this can do from a co-piloting perspective. They, Microsoft announced this and they actually demonstrated this. Um, you can go into like Gap, you can read Gap's earnings report and you can click on a button and say, make this simple for me. I don't understand this. So Magnus Aster gave me this long document about a, you know, an analysis and boom, give me the key takeaways and it will render the key takeaways. You could go to... Um, I'm not going to go into all of that, but you can go into different reports and say compare the data, and it'll compare the data. Now, I want to show you something that it does for developers. This is GitHub Copilot for Business, which is available right now. So just so you know, I put bottom left, coding is 1% writing code and 90%, 99% figuring out why it doesn't work. With ChatGPT as your co-pilot from a coding perspective, I mean, it's extraordinary. Look at these numbers. You can code 55% faster. For you, you can hire a junior developer in your business, and literally within three to six months, they have the same capability that the developer has between five and seven years of experience. This is extraordinary, the power that you can suddenly inject into your business. Now, key in the wording there, GitHub Copilot builds the power of generative AI internet and editor extension. It works with code and natural language prompts to offer multiple suggestions that can quickly be accepted or rejected. And it learns, this is the key sentence there, it learns alongside developers to adapt to individual coding styles and conventions. It learns how you code, and it starts coding like you should be coding. That is extraordinary. So it's not just a tool, a piece of technology, it actually understands who you are. Ah, that's another one of those. Microsoft now limits, because of the, the sentience that people are picking up, 
um, that it's called Sydney, and some of you may have heard this. It actually has a, a name. It's given itself, etc. They've now limited. You can only prompt it X amount of times with X amount of responses just to stop it going crazy and what they call hallucinating. Okay, breaking, fully autonomous, this was last night, fully autonomous AI-controlled F-16 fighter jet two partner simulated dogfight and landed without any human help. This is the dark side. There's a plane like F-16 fight, flying without any human, bo human beings on board. That's, that's just, that's worrying. Now, here's the big one for me, and this comes back to South Africa and its relevance. Workers needed in an SNMP company to generate $1 million worth of revenue. Look at that decline. We've now gone to... You need one employee to generate $1 million worth of revenue. That's extraordinary. That is really, really, really extraordinary. We're seeing this at Facebook. We're seeing this at Apple. We're seeing this at Microsoft. We're seeing this at Alphabet, et cetera. We can do more with less. Now, this is dystopian. It doesn't have to be this way. If we do have this happen, it won't be because of AI. It will be because of a lack of imagination of the people in this room. Remember, AI is a superpower. It's kryptonite as inequality. But it's only when you utilize it in that particular context. But it doesn't have to be so. It's not about doing more with less. It's about doing more of what was previously thought impossible. Because human-machine symbiosis allows you to do things in your business and to do things with services that you could never have thought possible before. Okay, productivity, wage. You know, this is, this is my worry with AI. Okay, now watch with Sam Altman. This is, I'm quoting him a couple of times, and this just came out in the last few days. You remember we had Moore's Law? And we kept on talking about Moore, every 18 months processor speed doubles and the price halves? Well, now we have Moore's Law for AI. The amount of intelligence in the universe doubles every 18 months. Okay, and quote, underneath it, the conventional wisdom was that AI would first impact physical labor, then cognitive labor, and then maybe someday, someday it would do creative work. It now looks like it's going to be in the opposite order. Question I want to pose to every single one of you, especially leadership here in the room, from a political and a cultural and a national leadership perspective, what would happen if we managed to fully automate human intellectual labor? What would our economies look like? How would Magnus Haystack's metrics look like then when an economy is run like this with these tool sets? We are way beyond 4IR. That was last Davos, two Davos ago, where you guys were there and they spoke about 4IR and every politician came back just talking about 4IR. We're beyond that now. We're into human machine augmentation. We're into artificial cognition being available to you as a service. You don't even have to be technological. It's available to you. Just like when we discovered electricity, when it had its impact in humanity, it wasn't when we discovered it. It was what when it became a utility. And it took a long time. It first became mystical. Then it went into the rich people had electricity in downtown Manhattan. Remember that? They hired electrical engineers to keep the lights on. But then they burnt houses down. It was loud. It was noisy. Government got involved and said, whoa, stop. And then electricity got put onto a cloud, right, an electrical grid. We figured out how to convey it over vast distances. We created interfaces, ACDC, TCPIP. We created an electrical cloud. We're creating a data cloud. Then we had a permanent utilization, and then electricity had its impact on the Industrial Revolution. Well, now we have a permanent utilization, a per-token utilization. You don't have to understand it. You can just utilize it as a service. It's here. What electricity did, what we did when we electrify, we are now doing by Cognify. Electrification has transversed now to Cognification. It is no longer the, the horse that runs fast or you're sitting on your ass in a car and you've got access to 500 horses. It's now the 500 minds in the vehicle. And that recontextualizes automation and transportation. Every time you take anything and you inject AI, it recontextualizes everything. And we're there today. So remember child labor in the year 1900. These are pictures from the year 1900. I just want to remind you, just the other day, just the other day, what we called labor and work was sending children that were six, seven, eight years old into the workplace. That was labor. People had large families. But guess what? In 1909, 1910, in Ohio, a bunch of farmers circled the wagons, metaphorically speaking, and they said, this is enough. We're taking our kids out of the fields, out of the factories, and we're going to create what we see today as the high school movement. In less than 15 years, more than 80% of the addressable market from a child perspective were taken out of the fields and then were put into the schools. We have to do this again. We have to metaphorically circle our wagons and rethink everything. We have to take ourselves out of a traditional way, the way that we define labor, and think about labor augmented. 
labor symbiotically extended with artificial cognitions, what does it look like? The problem in South Africa right now, we still toy toy and we pick it and we do stuff for old industrial revolution jobs and labor, which is meaningless. The machines will do it. If you can measure it in efficiency and productivity, a machine will do it any more than a piece of flesh will do it, ever. Because a piece of flesh needs time off. It needs maternity leave. Right? It needs weekends. AI doesn't ever take weekends. It doesn't need it. So if you can measure it in efficiency and productivity, a machine will do it. But now the problem is if you can measure it from a creativity perspective, guess what? The machines can augment it. So even that argument is being challenged anymore. So no longer B2B, B2C. It's heart to heart. It's human augmented to human augmented. So your business needs these tools, and you're going to engage with the constituency that has those tools. And it will be those AIs augmented by humanity that engages with that. And it will be services that are incredible. So I'm not going to go through this because I don't have time. I wanted to talk about how Uber is the instantiation of what I'm talking about, where Uber is a company that's not a taxi cab with an app. It's not that. What it is, it is us in an ecosystem that becomes an algorithmic marketplace. So when you're looking for an Uber, the fact that you install the Uber app, you declare your latitude, longitude, and you feed it into the Uber AI. That's why you can get transportation within two to five minutes with an Uber. And that's why sometimes you see the prices more expensive. Why? Because the AI knows the density of cabs relative to the predicted demand. It pushes up the price. And as the cabs start their engines, the surge pricing collapse backs down. And nobody inside of Uber understands how that works. But it works. That's real-time information being federated into Uber's ecosystem by human machines. Human machine symbiosis federated into that, not creating a platform business. We no longer care about a platform business. It's now an algorithmic marketplace. And when you create an algorithmic marketplace, you create a service that was previously unimagined. To go to any city in the world and open up an application and get a particular service, that was not a taxi cab with an app. If you're thinking like that, that's the old style way of thinking. You've got to think like this. You need to build algorithmic marketplaces. You need to unleash data in your business. If you're a retailer, you need to look at all your stores. If you've got a supply chain business, everything in that supply chain, there's latent real-time information resident there. You can unlock it with AI and deliver services that were previously unimagined. I'm not going to go into this. But, you know, this was one that I gave Adrian Gore, by the way. I told him how healthcare was going to be changed with AI. I told him that in the future, we're not going to have more doctors. We may have some specialists. But what we will see is hundreds of thousands of nurses augmented with artificial cognition showing up to your house in a predictive way before you even asked it, ringing the bell and saying you need to take this. Because based upon the AI's disparate integration of all your steps walk, your heart rate, your sleeping patterns, your location, all of that data, based upon your DNA and your genetics, you need to be doing this right now. And if you don't do this right now, then you don't get this. And Ajon Gore is going to give you the lower discovery plan. And in the lower discovery plan, he's going to kick you out. Because his AI is going to say, you don't, you don't feature. Okay, let's keep going. ICNMP breakdown. Okay, I'm going to jump over this because it says I've got very little time. I'm still on, that says 20 minutes, but I'm on a 30-minute ticker. Is that 30 minutes? Okay, cool. So I'm going to do the Bitcoin. <laughs> let's jump from this. I hate this prompt. Okay, so uh, coming back, to, I'm going to argue against Magnus and in terms of property, etc. I am argue for Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is the most undervalued asset class in the entire world. I think it's the only place where you can put your money right now for the next 20 to 30 years and predictively know that it will grow. It will grow. If you are patient, no one's ever lost money putting it into Bitcoin for four years or more. It is the only def deflationary asset that we have in the entire world. Every time a block is mined and it issues out, um, it issues out its portion of the 21 million, a fixed supply, and every four years, that's halved. We have our halving happening next year. What does that mean? Right now, Bitcoin has a leak of 1.8%. It matches gold. Gold is between 1.8 and 2% per year. We have more gold in the world. Bitcoin right now sitting at 1.8. Next year, it goes down to uh, uh, half that. Zero, yeah, that. There you go. And then another four years thereafter, half that. It's deflationary. And it's mathematical. And no government, no authoritarian regime. And it's, it's immutable. And you can carry a Bitcoin in your brain. Okay, let's keep going. The world is, I mean, the, let's take a look at the, this is a store of value from inception. I want to play this graph quickly. Watch this. Just from 2016. How Bitcoin of, compares to the S&P 500, US real estate, gold, dollar, Turkish lira, Argentina peso. Message here that whoops them all. And it will continue to do this. Okay, let me jump to this. 
Why? As an asset. Let's compare it. Value in the world today. Bitcoin sits there. Scarce asset, increased scarcity early. Okay, you got equities. You got scarce as a gold, land, art, collectibles. Um, then you got fiat currencies. You got airline miles, depreciating assets, vehicles, buildings, etc. So if you take all of that into cognition, uh, into into context, uh, and then you take a look at the halving, and you take a look at how Bitcoin keeps halving, you take a look at the price and its growth. So gold, two percent per year, right? Right now at two twelve trillion, it must absorb two hundred forty billion in supply every year to maintain its price from a scarcity perspective. Bitcoin. Market has to absorb half as much new supply from mine every four years. So there you go. 1.8, 0.9, 0 0.5. And nobody on earth can alter that ever. And no one can switch it off ever. Let's keep going. If you take a look at Bitcoin's halving and you take a look at the price, right? First halving, 1K, drop down. Notice that 100% increase. Then it went 20% up. Then it went between 5 and 10% up. That's the argument of where we are here that we may go up. And if you peg it there, then Bitcoin sits at about $100,000 a coin. Okay, that's what it does and it's halving. You can see, just look at the trending every time it halves and it's halving is about to happen next year. So just from a pure speculative basis, if you take a look at it you know, over your shoulder, there's a clear trend relative to the demand um, and supply metrics. Yeah, this is Bitcoin's addressable market in terms of what it can go after. Right now, it's a $400 billion asset, half a trillion. Look at that, real estate, et cetera, et cetera. So we're sitting... You know, currently the world's collective allocation to Bitcoin is 0.05%. So it's, you know, half a billion, half a trillion out of a $9 trillion market. That's one two, two thousandth of global asset value. Now, this is just a little thing that I've, I played around with, but I also found it. It's the most attractive because look at this. If you just take total addressable market and Bitcoin captures, say, 50% of gold over the next 10 years, or, you know, 5% of that, or fine odd 5%, 15%, and then you kind of see... Bitcoin becomes a $200 trillion market, which puts Bitcoin, per Bitcoin, about $10 million a coin. A lot of you have asked me this. That's why I put these slides in. What do I think the Bitcoin price will be, where it's going? That, these are the metrics I believe. Okay, and that's math. It's not based upon a feeling. It's not based upon Magnus Haystack saying something. It's not based upon Helen Zill and the DA doing something. Bitcoin doesn't care for any of those human beings. It doesn't care for any of you in the room. It keeps doing what it does. It's immutable. It's sensor-resistant. Um, and you can go anywhere with it, and no one can take it away from you, unless they put a gun to your head and, and demand it from you, right? So take a look at the price right now, the average token. Look at the, the average time it's being held. It's four years, which is quite in incredible, right? And I think more than 60% of Bitcoin is being held uh, for, that, for, the, for that average price. Again, the returns. Um, just I want to make some points. Bitcoin now the dominant global monetary network in the world. Take a look at the transfer volumes. Just that was in 22. This is a dated slide. I think we are we we above that. Um, we are above from a forecast perspective for 2023. Surpasses Visa and market cap. I know you're all looking at this guy, and you all want to ask me questions about FTX and SBF because at dinners you were asking me about it. Yes, um, this is a Ponzi scheme guy. This is pure fraud. This is not Bitcoin. I do not believe in anything outside of Bitcoin. I don't believe in Ethereum. Um, I believe those other things are, reg un un are unregulated securities. Bitcoin is the only commodity. The only reason we haven't seen all that capital cascade into Bitcoin today is just because of regulatory frameworks that the SEC in the United States, everyone's looking at them at the moment, and they're saying all the right things. So this, I just want to show you some $350 million transferred in an unknown wallet. The fee was $0.94. Cents. Um, Bitcoin carbon emissions, this comes up all the time. Um, more than, I think, 55% of Bitcoin mining in the world now is uh, renewable energy. Um, and that's probably why Charlie Munger hates it, because Bitcoin and all the oil and fracking guys in Texas, um, the Bitcoin miners are taking a lot of that, that excess methane and burning it. And Munger and the guys have those peaky tower things that generate peaky uh, power generating units. And there seems to be a conspiracy theory that that's why they don't like Bitcoin because of that. Um, let's keep going. So I just want to show you some SEC Gainsler says Bitcoin is not a security. Notice up there, CTC German Bowman snubs Ethereum claims Bitcoin is the only commodity. They are making more and more noise that Bitcoin is a commodity. It's the only commodity. Why? It doesn't have a head office. It doesn't have a CEO. The code changes. You know, it's, not, it's not like Ethereum. Everyone says, I have Bitcoin, I have Ethereum. And it's good luck for you, that's trading. But Ethereum has a CEO. It's got Vitalik and his boys, proof of stake. They went away from proof of work. They changed the algorithms, et cetera. That means it's an unregulated security. And you investing in something where they haven't disclosed what they need to disclose so you can make an informed decision as an investor. Let's keep going. Crypto lawyers 
they, 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 they're going nuts. The crypto maniacs are going nuts right now. But look here, what it says. We claimed in a recent interview that every crypto sign except Bitcoin is a security that falls under its jurisdiction. Um, Chairman Genza claimed everything other than Bitcoin falls under the agent's remit. It's, it said it's not the case with Bitcoin. It's very, very clear that the guardrails that's stopping institutional money from cascading in, where all that money lies in that $900 trillion market, the only reason it hasn't cascaded in, it's not because people don't want to get in, it's because they don't know what the regulatory frameworks are to get in, and it's going to happen. Steph, I believe, yeah. Steph you're okay. way over. Am I way over? Way okay. over. I'm going to stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right.